It's time for another edition of Prose with Vicki Locke and Cindy Woolley from C2 Communications. Cheers. Cheers, everybody. We are back. Prose, Cindy and Vicki. I'm Vicki, she's Cindy. I'm drinking a delightful champagne again because it is the holidays. What about you? La 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 la. I am festive with my Cabernet. A little line 39 again. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, you'll notice I have a, a bit of a different backdrop behind me. I'm, I uh, went over the river and through the woods to <laughs> grandmother's house, I say. So I have pretty, pretty paintings and cookies. Oh, I want some. So my mom and my daughter spent the afternoon baking cookies today. So it's really a, a sweet Sweet Christmas tradition to bake and and uh, have some fun together. What about Mom you? Mom Nancy, who is our biggest fan. We love yes. Winston. <laughs> Do you see over my shoulder over here? Do Can you see? Yes. Yes. There's a, a, a blob. What is in the blob? My husband and I make our own lemon cello. Ooh. That's our tasty treat for the Christmas holidays. Yum, yum. You'll have to save me a glass. I will. It's still it's still in the stage where we haven't put it in bottles yet, but you're going to love it. It's, it's delicious. Perfect bite. I was going to tell you that there is a uh, new survey out that says 55% of us think that our own biography would make a great book or movie. What do you think? I think that I'm fantastic and it would be a fantastic book. So, you know, I'd read me. What about you? Would you, you? Read you? <laughs> Would you tell all? Mm, yes, yes. Because Nancy will be reading. Oh, well, anything that I don't tell, she will. She'll she'll be definitely hitting the, the talk circuit. Okay. Filling in all the details <laughs> for sure. <laughs> what about you? you? Uh, Anissa, is that how you say her name? And it's time for another edition of Prose with Vicki Locke and Cindy Woolley from C2 Communications. Technical glitch, my bad. Yes, yes. Oh, we were doing so well in rehearsal. Oh it was so perfect. What you well, let's do? get to it right now, shall we? Because she is back. We are so excited. Patty Callahan Henry is with us today. She's the New York Times, USA Today, Globe and Mail, best-selling novelist of 16 books, including Becoming Mrs. Lewis. Love it. My friend Lynn Hunt's book club book choice, I think recently, just loves that book. Also Surviving Savannah. That's what we, we talked to her last about that book. Mm -hmm. So um, her new book is called Once Upon a Wardrobe. Again, all things C.S. Lewis, she loves. Now I love because of her. And this is such a wonderful story, perfect for the holidays. It's about a teenage girl named Megs, who is this math whiz, and she will do anything for her little brother, George, who is dying. And all he wants is to find out some secrets from C.S. Lewis himself about a novel that he wrote, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Let's bring her in to Prose. Welcome back, Patty Callahan Henry. Yeah. Patty. So I was listening to y'all talk about that and I was thinking, I don't, I think my life is great, but I don't think anybody wants to read about it. <laughs> <laughs> sure we do. I don't think anybody wants to read the PCH biography. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think you need to add a few things to your bucket list, right? That's just I know I need to do something biography worthy. Go like, a little crazy. Something with a twist, right? Mm. Yes. I'll have some of that limoncello with a twist for dinner. Okay. It's really good. I will definitely want some of that. I what are you drinking? Have a special machine, Vicky? It's like No, a no, it's it's lemons and clear grain alcohol, basically, and simple syrup. It just takes, got to let it kind of sit for a while. Ferment. Okay. I'm going to try it. I thought you were pointing to like a machine, but you were just saying it was back there. Well, it looks like it's a big container. It's a okay. big, yeah. So, <laughs> but I'll let you have some. I'll make you a bottle. You'll love it. 
That's really cool. So cheers. You're celebrating a special, a special anniversary too, right? 16, sweet 16. 16. And today is actually my daughter and her husband's wedding anniversary. Oh, oh four years. So that's reason. what I thought you were talking hey. about. And I was like, wait a minute. Did I tell her that? <laughs> no, no. Yeah. So if you could have, I'm, I'm sure you talked to a lot of people with, with book clubs. What if C.S. Lewis had a book club and was was picking apart your book? What do you think he would say? Oh, my gosh. That sounds like a, one of my fears. Like you, no. like you went back into my <laughs> deep, dark subconscious, Vicki, and you like dug around and <laughs> like pulled it out. Um, I think that I, I think he would care about my motivations, which were to honor him and to show the parts of his life and to also show the parts of his life. I always say that, it, that he took ordinary moments and through the power and alchemy of story, transformed them into something extraordinary in Narnia. And I think he would enjoy seeing that seeing that someone made the link from the ordinary, from what he did in the ordinary to the extraordinary. But he was just such a master of words and prose and probably prose, but he was such a master of words and prose that I'd be, I think I'd be terrified to hear what he said about the actual storytelling. But I think he'd be honored by the way it was portrayed. I think he would love it. Oh, thank you. I, I hope. think we're all too hard on ourselves. Absolutely. He would celebrate this. I do think we're hard on ourselves. And I think he was hard on himself. Um, I think all those authors were. And by the way, I can see y'all in the comments. Hi, Anissa. Hi, Susie. Hi, Felix. Um, hi, Deb. But I think, you know, they would get together these men of Oxford in the fifties and forties and talk to each other and read each other their work out loud. And they were brutal with each other. So I have a feeling if I sat down in the middle, first of all, I probably wouldn't have been allowed because I was a woman, but if I sat down in the Oxford pub with them and started to read this story out loud, um, I think I would be a little, I think, I think, I don't think they were gentle with each other. I can say that. Really? In fact, Tolkien, J.R.R. Tolkien, of course, The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings, he told um, Lewis that he didn't like Narnia. So he said he used too many different kinds of myths when he wrote it. What did he know? What did he know? And guess what? He <laughs> bought it as presents for his grandchildren. So whatever. <laughs> so were you obsessed did. with that book with the wardrobe? When I was growing up? Yeah. Oh, I was. I was. So I wasn't necessarily obsessed with the entire Narnia series. Like I, I wasn't and am not a Narnia expert, meaning, you know, if you want to talk to me about the horse and his boy or the last battle, I'm not going to be able to have a truly deep conversation about it beyond the overview of it. But I was quite enamored with The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And these children who were sent to the country, because who does not want to walk into a wardrobe and walk into a magical land where you are a queen and they forgot to tell you, you know, you leave your ordinary world to enter this magical world where you are, a throne is waiting for you and animals can talk and there's a witch and a lion and good wins in the end. It just, it, it hits everything, I don't know if every child's heart, but it def definitely hit everything that my heart liked about story um, and transformation and fairy tales and myth and who doesn't want to be a queen? <laughs> Do you find yourself to be like Meg's more logical? I would say absolutely not because of your, your books. And George, who just the wonder of his imagination that's kind of keeping him alive. I just loved 
that relationship, the relationship with the parents, and then you bring in a love relationship, it just, wardrobe had kind of like everything for everybody. Oh, thanks. That, that, that means a lot to me. I actually was and am a lot like Meg's, believe it or not. Really? Well, you know, I used to be a nurse. So my initial training was medical. And I was a nurse for a long time in Atlanta, would listen to Vicki on the radio. And I was very, um, you know, and am very scientific and logical, but I'm also completely enamored and fascinated by the imagination. And I think part of what I was trying to show with this book is that there's a, there's a Meg and there's a George in all of us. Mm. And we're always battling this logic versus imagination. Lot, do I believe it? It's not logical enough. Prove it to me. But my imagination and my intuition, they show me that there's something more or, or what is that? And and it's a, I think it's a constant battle with all of us. And I think that if we plant our flag in one spot, I'm only going to be logical or I'm only going to be imaginative and flights of fancy. Both of those, you know, flag stands don't do us any good. So I wanted to have a little bit of an exploration of it's not either or, it's and both. And it ebbs and flows. It's fluid, right? Yes. That's wonderful. There are times where we we just will only, it's like a wave, right? And you're exactly right, Cindy. And there are times when we can only rely on our logic and we go too far in one way and we swing our pendulum. And then there's times we're off on these flights of fancy and someone has to bring us back to center. Mm -hmm. We actually um, have a couple of questions popping up here. Oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, Anissa asks, Queen Patty, which character was the <laughs> hardest to write? Did you know the ending of the book from the beginning? Um, which character was the hardest to write? The mom. The mom. Mm. And I think Meg's came to me very naturally. I knew her from the minute she walked on the page. George, I knew the most intimately. It took me a little longer to get to know Meg's, but I still didn't consider her hard to write. But every time the mom came on the scene, I was a mom. And so I, you know, in, in the book, it's not a spoiler, there is a, a young son who's gravely ill. And, and the opening line of the book is George knows. He knows he is, is not long for this beautiful world. And so I don't fool you or try to twist the situation, but to write the, the mom, how does she help her daughter who's in college well deal with what's going on with her son? And we never get her point of view. We only hear from Megs and C.S. Lewis and the young brother, George. Those are the only points of view that we drop into their head and their heart. But the mom, every time she came on the scene, I was just, I almost wanted to write the story without the parents, you know, like the peanuts. Every time the parents come on, all they do is go, right. Oh, 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 right? <laughs> um, so that was, I think she was the hardest for me to write. But between George and Meg's, Meg's was a little bit harder, but I, I knew her. I knew, I knew the journey she was going to have to take and the journey that she was on. Um, and did I know the ending of the book from the beginning? I did. I didn't know how we would get there and I didn't know how I would write it. And I didn't know how you would see it, but I did know how it would end. And without spoilers, there is an epilogue to the book that I took in and put out and took in, put in and took out, put in and took out at least three times. And in the end, I let my publisher decide whether to keep the epilogue. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Did you know what C.S. Lewis's house was going to look like when you were writing this? I did. So when I was writing Becoming Mrs. Lewis, I took a research trip to England and I toured his house. And now I have been probably four or five times to his house. It is called The Kilns. It is in Oxfordshire, right outside of Oxford, England. 
and um, you can get tours. The C.S. Lewis Foundation maintains it, and it's pretty much decorated and in, and furnished exactly the way it was when he lived there. So I got I went through the gardens and his rooms and the common room where he spent all his time and where his desk would have been and his couch would have been and the bookshelves and and the little kitchen. It's almost literally exactly the same as when he lived there. So there's a little end room off the kitchen that where the where um, Joy's son lived. So when I was writing that part for this book, it was during the pandemic. So obviously I didn't travel back there, but I had been enough times that I knew what Megs would see when she walked through that green door and into the back hallway with the herringbone floors and the pegs where the coats were hung and that common room on the left with the brick fireplace. I could see it, I could smell it, and I wanted her and you, the reader, to do the same. We did, because I've got to tell you, there's just a few books in my life where I'm reading it, and all of a sudden I think there's um, maybe just a few more pages left, and I stopped myself because I didn't want it to end. Oh, thank you, Vicki. You know that means so much to me. When I was writing it, like I said, during the pandemic, it was this, I said this off air before we came on, but it was this still point in a madly burning world. And that still point, I didn't want to end either, which is where the epilogue came from. Because part of me wanted and needed to know what next, what next. Now becoming Mrs. Lewis, Joy, we find out about her and she is so strong and you don't have to read that to wardrobe it's it's they're completely different yes. but i was thinking is meg's that do you think that c.s lewis brought her into his home because she was so strong like his his wife oh i love that you noticed that i think you know when i was doing my research for becoming mrs lewis i saw all these little nodal points or hints or seeds or whatever word you want to use of his life that I could see in Narnia, right? But when I started writing this book and decided to tap into those events I saw in his life when I did the research, I also was tapping into other things I knew about his life. For example, his mother was, her name was Flora. She was fascinating and she's in this book. So you get to meet her, but you didn't get to meet her in Becoming Mrs. Lewis. And I did that podcast after Mrs. Lewis called Behind the Scenes of Becoming Mrs. Lewis. And I talk about and interview an expert on Jack's family, C.S. Lewis's family. And almost everybody who is an expert on his family says that his mother prepared him for a woman like Joy. His mother was strong and smart and interesting and very opinionated and a woman way ahead of her time. She had a mathematics degree in the 1800s in Belfast, Ireland. And uh, Meg's reflects a little bit of Lewis's mother, who is the prototype and the preparation for meeting a strong, fascinating, genius, creative and complicated woman like Joy. So when I was writing a completely imaginary character in Meg, I wanted her to reflect a little bit of his mother, Flora, who was a math and physics, you know, that's what she went to school for. And so he would see in Megs a woman like his mother. And Once Upon a Wardrobe takes place in November, October, November of 1950. In November, October, November of 1950, Lewis was having a pen pal relationship with the woman who would be his wife, Joy but he hadn't met her yet. So in many ways, Meg's was a preamble to later meet. He met Joy in person in 1953. That's lovely. What about, what about this, uh, perhaps your children? Do you have aspects of your children that have, have morphed into these characters as well? So I don't usually tell this story but it is the only book where I have ever used all of my children's names. So I have three children 
and they are Megan, and Megan is 29 and has two kids. And then my son, um, Patrick Thomas, but he goes by Thomas, but his name is Patrick. And then my youngest son, who's 23, is George Rusk. He goes by Rusk, but his first name is George. So oh George, gosh. yeah, so George, and George is also my father. So George is my, the name, the character is not like my father, but George, the name comes from my father and my son. And then the best friend that Megs meets, Patrick from Ireland is my son, Patrick. And then Megs is Megan. So there's wow. not a lot of qualities about them, except maybe their curiosity and kind of their um, zest for life. But I used all three of my kids' names in this book, and I've never done that before. Well, Patrick's pretty perfect, in my opinion, the character. Patrick, ba-boom, ba-boom, ba-boom. So <laughs> do, you, Absolutely. Um, do you like the BBC, like, British shows? Have you ever watched Endeavor? No. Endeavor. So Endeavor is a BBC show. I, I'm totally enamored by it. Um, and it is the prequel to a show I've actually never watched, which is um, Inspector... Lewis, I think it's Inspector Lewis. It's it's a it's a like a detective show, but this is the prequel. And the carrot, the man who plays Endeavor in this show is named Sean Evans. When you get off, Google Sean Evans Endeavor, and you'll see Patrick. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Again, my heart's going to be going like. Well, I love him. Because I must have to do it now. So down to when he showed up on the page i didn't see him coming i do have to tell you that and so when he showed up on that bridge on the maudlin bridge and he walked up i um i kind of laughed because he was just so matter of fact and so um i knew he was exactly what megs needed and when i was battling this um logic versus imagination logic versus imagination. And I was started thinking about how when we have two opposing forces and you can't reconcile them, what has to happen is a third has to come in to wreck it, to bring it together. Mm. And that is what Patrick was. He represented kind of a melding of the two and without lecture, without being forceful, he took that adventure with them that changed everything. And he was so kind. I mean, his heart, he just was, like I said, he's pretty, pretty damn perfect. <laughs> yeah. 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 And if it would have been a longer book and it hadn't been based, it, it, if it hadn't, you know, whenever we're writing these works that could go off in a thousand directions, right? Like it, even with Mrs. Lewis, that book could have been a trilogy. Nobody wanted to wait three books to see them kiss, but you know, there's this, all these directions you can go in, all these rabbit trails. And, and I could have run off with that one too, but I really wanted to stick with the cornerstone of the story, which was the moments in an author's life that show up in a novel or an imaginative work and how you can see all these hints and clues. And sometimes Someone else can see your life in a book even more than you can, but how you can see moments of an author's life in a book. And yet there are these large swaths of story source that are completely ineffable, completely unexplainable and mysterious. And I knew the more that I ran off with their relationship or that romance, the less we moved away from what I wanted the book to be about. Mm. Good. Maybe they get yep. their own story. <laughs> we have another question from Susie asking if you have plans to revisit Lewis and his world in a future book. So what's on the what's on the horizons? I do not have any plans, but I said that after I wrote Mrs. Lewis, so we'll see. But um, what I'm working on now doesn't doesn't visit the Lewis world in any way. But that doesn't mean I never will. But right now, I don't have any plans to do so. If you could have dinner with either Joy or Jack, who would it be? Oh, oh my God. 
joy. Really? 100%. Yeah. I, I feel, you know, I've spent years with her now. Years. That's such a good question, Vicki. Nobody's ever asked me that. <laughs> um, I have spent years with her, researching her, reading her, writing about her. I want to know how much I got right. I have yeah. questions for her. And I also feel like she could tell me whatever I wanted to know about Jack anyway. So I'll just spend some time with her. That's great. Yeah. She's pretty well, fascinating. What Before we let you go, what are you doing for the holidays? Is all the family together? Is COVID causing any difficulties to be able to spend time I mean, with your loved ones? COVID is causing so many difficulties. How about y'all? Is it have y'all been able to escape unscathed? Or are you is it altering your plans? Uh, literally, just literally just before this show, we found out my daughter's been exposed to COVID, and you know she's got no symptoms or anything, and she's been vaccinated. But um, you know, there's always that like, oh my goodness, pressure. Here we go. And I know, I know. How about you, Vicki? I have uh, some friends that we're going to come in next week. And even though they're vaccinated, one does have COVID, so that's off. So I'm thinking uh, our little holiday dinner will just be my husband and myself, which is okay as long as everybody's safe. And uh, how about you? So my daughter lives in Hawaii, and um, they flew, they came home for a month, and they flew home eight days ago, 10 days ago. And so we all quarantined the first few days, did some home COVID tests, made sure everything was fine. My son-in-law ran and went, got a PCR test because he had like a stuffy nose. But now we're all clear. And so everybody's coming for the holidays, but everybody's vaccinated. But so I have both my sons and my daughter and the grandbabies and everybody's gonna be here. So I'm- Are you I'm cooking? Who's people. cooking? Um, we all chip in. My son-in-law is a great cook. My husband's a great cook. So I, I'm a decent cook, but, um, it, it's not the cooking y'all. I don't know if you found this. It's the freaking dishes. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot keep up with the unloading and reloading of the dishwasher. <laughs> it's like, it is like the the mythical creature rolling the rock up the mountain and it rolls back to like, oh my gosh. It's <laughs> crazy. I'm not used to it. We're empty nesters, you know, and you make a sandwich, they make a sandwich, they make an egg, they make it. And I'm like, what? The dishes are having babies. What is happening? <laughs> and one more question. As the writer in the family, do you read read to the kids? I mean, do you do the oh, night yeah. before Christmas or is that like, no, that's my job. I'm not doing that for the holidays. Oh my gosh. No. I mean, I probably have given Bridget is my granddaughter. She's three. I have given her more books than I have tutus. I mean, I've given her so many books and we're having a Chris, Christmas Eve tradition where, um, we're all, we each get randomly assigned someone in the family and you have to pick a special book for them. So we'll exchange on Christmas Eve books for each other. So that oh, is wonderful. wonderful. I love that. Yeah. So no, it's an integral part of our family. Someone's always reading a book to Bridget and we're, my mother-in-law just came over for the afternoon. And the first thing I asked her was, what are you reading? Because we talk about it all the time. So no, it's an integral part of the family. Uh, no way. I, I can't wait to read her a Christmas Eve night before Christmas book. I can't wait. Well, thanks so much for being on the show. Oh, Patty Callahan oh, Henry, you. you can find her books everywhere. And if you haven't read this latest book, Once Upon a Wardrobe, you're doing yourself a disservice because especially this time of year and things that are going on, it's just, it's wonderful. You will feel so good about the world, about life, about your family. Thank you for writing it. It's such a great gift. I appreciate it so much. Thank you, my friend. I'm so glad y'all have me on twice. I feel like I won the lottery. So, <laughs> so write another book really quick so we can have you on again. I'm trying. <laughs> right now I'm playing with a three-year-old, but I'm trying. Okay. <laughs> All right, y'all. Happy Thanks. holidays. Cheers. Cheers. Happy holidays. Join us next week for another edition of Prose with Vicki Locke and Cindy Woolley from C2 Communications.